My name is Dave Donahue. I'm a intellectual property practice group leader and a leader of Holland and Knight's technology industry sector group. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Holland and Knight to welcome all of you to this webinar prepared by our technology industry sector group. Uh, the technology group includes over 200 attorneys that support clients in all aspects of technology issues across corporate, M&A, litigation, intellectual property, public policy, and many more areas, including uh, deep technology industry as well as actual technology experience. Um, we all know artificial intelligence is impacting each of us in our personal and our professional lives. Um, because of that, Holland and Knight has put together within the technology industry sector a group of AI lawyers, 50 plus, um, that bring to bear technology experience, industry experience, government experience to assist with AI issues. Um, the Holland and Knight Public Policy and Regulation Group is a critical part of that when it comes to emerging regulatory issues. Um, and so it's my pleasure to turn things over to our public policy team and our IP team to help you break down the most important takeaways from yesterday's artificial intelligence executive order. Joel? Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, we're really pleased to be here with you, especially on the uh, closely following on the heels of, of such a large and significant executive order related to artificial intelligence. We've got an all-star lineup here of folks that are leading um, attorneys on artificial intelligence across all of Holland and Knight's uh, different uh, public policy uh, components. And before we dive in, just so you know who uh, is speaking, we'll do quick introductions. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I've been Joel Roberson. I've been at Holland and Knight for 17 years. My practice focuses on the intersection of technology and transportation. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Joel. I'm Paul Steimers. I recently joined Holland and Knight from another uh, major law firm. And for the last 20 years, I've been focusing on disruptive uh, technology policy lobbying. Uh, AI, quantum computing, commercial space flight, things like that. Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Serafino. Uh, I'm an associate in the PPNR group at Holland and Knight. I primarily work on uh, various technology issues, especially with an access to national security. Happy to be with you. Uh, Todd. Todd Wooten, also here in DC with Holland and Knight. Um, I do all things that relate to the Senate. Um, and I get to hang out with really, really intelligent people on the issues, and I kind of help track the politics. And Dan. Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Barsky. I'm a partner in the Miami office in the Intellectual Property and Technology Group, uh, and my focus is on intellectual property and technology, emerging technologies, uh, both litigation and transactional. Great, thanks. So this team, along with our uh, larger team of about 130 uh, Professionals have been working with clients to influence policy related to a variety of technology issues, uh, including AI, and help prepare for the AI-enabled future um, and, and all that that entails. One thing that's important to note is with this executive order y issued yesterday, what the administration is, is not doing is saying, we are going to limit what the private sector is ab ab able to access when it comes to computing power. What they are doing is saying, we have a certain worldview that we wanna make sure that we can harness the opportunities of artificial intelligence while managing the risks. And we're gonna do that by taking a, a long list of executive branch actions uh, to get ahead of, of the issues uh, that, that are potentially posed by artificial intelligence. We wanna structure this as a conversation. So we will be um, uh, posing questions to each other as we go through this session, but we also wanna take your uh, feedback and make sure that we're answering the questions that are top of mind for you as you dig through this executive order. So as a question comes to you, please add it into uh, the Q&A uh, uh, portion of the uh, Zoom platform and we can answer those questions as we go. We'll also reserve some time at the end dedicated uh, specifically to questions. So with that housekeeping out of the way, let's go ahead and dive in. So uh, Paul, the first question is to you. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, they've been around for a long time. Um, why now? Why is the president signing an executive order? Uh, how is, have things culminated to this moment in time that the 
the president felt like he needed to take actions on artificial intelligence. Sure. Thank you, Joel. So uh, the president didn't just uh, just wake up yesterday morning and decide to do this. Obviously, there's been uh, a lot of uh, developments over the last several months and 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 really the last year. Uh, to begin with, uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT made quite a splash uh, at the end of 2022. Like any disruptive technology, it caught people largely by surprise. Uh, and companies have been racing to deploy more and more capable generative AI as broadly and as quickly as possible. Uh, so that, that uh, certainly brings tremendous potential benefits, uh, but also creates serious concerns, national security, economic safety, privacy, and other concerns that need to be addressed. And so why now? The, the, the reason is because the window for meaningful uh, regulation is already beginning to close. And the administration didn't want to get too far down that path uh, before, before taking care of, of the situation. So once uh, large language models are, are released into the wild, it's virtually impossible, if, if, if it's possible at all, to get them back. And in most cases, it's simply not. Um, and, and so uh, this is an opportunity for, for the administration to, to try to begin uh, to get out a, ahead of that sort of thing. So uh, they're building on a number of, of efforts over the last year to begin with the release of the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights back in October of 2022. That was the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, then there was the release of the AI Risk, Man Risk Management Framework in January of 2023 from NIST. Uh, then there was Executive Order 1491, uh, 14,091, which was further advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government in February 2023, which had a significant AI uh, aspect to it. And most recently, the creation of the Trustworthy and Responsible AI Resource Center in March of 2023 and uh, through NIST. Now, at the same time as, as all of that's been going on within the administration, uh, Congress has been active. There's a Congressional AI Caucus. Uh, the Senate has had three all-Senator briefings. Every single Senator was invited to participate. One of those three briefings was, uh, was classified. Uh, Leader Schumer has had uh, the, the first couple of a series of AI insight forums. Uh, and, and, and these were extremely high-level uh, meetings where Senators were spending an entire day listening to some of the most influential and highly regarded experts in AI and, and, and in IT more broadly, uh, discuss their, their concerns, their priorities, their initiatives for AI. All of this is unprecedented activity uh, on, on the Hill, uh, absent a, a crisis that has already occurred. After a crisis, sure, you can, you can see things like this happening all the time. But before a, a, uh, before a galvanizing e event, it's very rare to see something like this. And indeed, we can't think of one in, in, in recent memory. Uh, so it was, it was within this context that the, uh, the Biden administration acted yesterday. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's the, the time is right for it. Thanks, Paul. And Paul, you mentioned that the Congress has been focused on this. You know, typically Congress is not, they're usually trying to catch up with technology. They're usually not on the forefront of passing legislation as technology is rapidly advancing. But in this case, it seems that AI has caught in the attention, uh, potentially spooked um, uh, Congress, if, if you will, on, on Halloween. But Todd, um, what would you, uh, could you help us describe what, how Congress has focused on this issue in the lead up to this executive order? Uh, and the collaboration that has existed between the administration on getting ahead of AI related issues. Sure. Um, a lot of the activity in Congress has focused on the Senate side, and obviously that's that's where you've had kind of um, the most public noise made uh, with the AI forums that Paul referenced, but also um, the various committees um, have have taken up different aspects, both at the subcommittee level as well as at the full committee level. And this was all part of a plan. Um, Senator Schumer gathered together um, chair men and women um, back in August and said, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this series of forums. And, you know, if your committee wants to be involved in it, they need to be holding hearings on AI. They need to be moving forward with that, et cetera. Um, I think it, at one point in time, um, you know, there was an idea that perhaps you could have um, some type of AI bill size and whether or not it's comprehensive or a little bit smaller, that was an open question that you could try to have it by the end of this year. 
Um, my understanding, and when I say that, I mean you would have it together. I don't mean that you would pass it, and I certainly don't mean that 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 it would go to the president's desk to be signed into law. Um, I think that as Senator Schumer has gone through this process with these forums, that while they've been, I would say, quite successful, um, and definitely for the staff um, who've been involved, they've really helped them to kind of flesh out ideas that they would want to put into a bill. Um, I'm not certain that they will have something that they will want to put out um, before January 1st. Uh, the reason why is, you know, again, these are just really complicated questions, which are a little different from kind of other policy things that we've tried to do in the past. You can draw certain parallels to social media and privacy and and various efforts there. But of course, um, if any of you are kind of active in this space, you know that privacy legislation has been talked about for many years. Um, and it hasn't come to pass. So people have not really figured out how to kind of solve those uh, solve those questions, even if they were going to be kind of translated here. And then you really have a problem of scope. Um, if you want to go big and do something very comprehensive on AI, um, that makes it more difficult politically uh, with just about anything. If you want to go smaller, then you're going to get criticism that you're not really taking on the kind of urgency of the issue. Um, and that's a word that that certainly Senator Schumer uses frequently. So um, they have the forum coming up on Wednesday. They've now started to do them in a bit different format. Um, they do one issue in the morning. They do a different one in the afternoon. Um, the one coming up next Wednesday, uh, I believe, in the, in the afternoon will be kind of interesting because it certainly focuses on privacy and social media. Um, I would imagine that that will draw some attention because, again, you're kind of getting into these issues that uh, folks nominally understand perhaps better than they understand AI. And then I think that they will probably look to wrap these forums up in early December. Um, and after that, then they will begin to talk about what they will be, what bill they will be putting out. Um, maybe they make a push to get it done before January 1st to actually have it out there where, where people can kind of look at it. For me personally, I think it'll probably drift. And I think you're probably looking more at the first part of next year. Thanks, Todd. So we have laid the landscape in terms of why now, um, how Congress has been involved, and there's been a back and forth on the development of uh, both legislation and the executive order. So we now have this very lengthy executive order. A typical executive order is probably three to five, maybe 10 pages long. This one is north of you know, 60, 80 pages, depending on your formatting of your document. But um, Marissa, could you help us break down kind of what how is it structured what is the um, content how does it direct different agencies um, to take particular actions and then we'll go through um, a lot of those actions but talk, let's talk at the top level about the structure of the document sure so the way i look at the document it's about 111 pages i think the longest executive order is about 166 i had to look that up so it's quite long um, the way that it's structured is there's sort of a preamble purpose at the top, um, followed there then by policy and principles. And the policy and principles, um, you know, include security, reliability, innovation, privacy, equity, um, there's eight of them. And then those principles actually correspond to the meat of the executive order, which is the following section. Um, or excuse me, so then there's definitions, which hopefully we'll come back to because I think those are really significant. But then after the definitions, there's the sort of corresponding subjects, um, I would actually call them objectives, where all of the directives for the agencies are found. Um, and so those, the principles sort of match up perfectly with the objectives. So there's eight of them. And then the last uh, component of that, of the executive order is implementation. Great. So as we then try and think through how we break this down, um, Dan, maybe I'll turn to you. You know, as AI tools are getting rolled out on a daily basis, and you know, from large language models to uh, more mundane versions of, of AI, companies are spending tons of time and effort to roll these out. The the customers of those AI products, as they integrate them into their workflow, whether it be for human resources or billing or collections or the actual conducting of the work. Um, they're spending lots of time, effort, um, and uh, paying significant sums to incorporate AI into their technology. Um, how can a company that's developing that, uh, that AI tool make sure that in light of this new uh, series of actions that, they're, that they are safeguarding the intellectual property that's going into that technology? Yeah, and I think that's one of the really 
big benefits that we're going to start seeing here out of this executive order. There's been just a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, just Wild West type activity going on in the business space. And I think having moving the ball forward a little bit here is going to bring help bring some certainty. I mean, we've even seen major companies like Microsoft offering to indemnify its customers who might get sued from using Microsoft's AI tools, which is a pretty unusual step. Normally, there's there's no indemnity if you were to read the terms and conditions of your regular, for example, Microsoft product. But I think this is really going to help. It's not the be all end all, but certainly we're moving the ball forward. We're advancing it down the field in terms of bringing some certainty to the space. And, and obviously, certainty helps drive innovation. It helps drive business decisions. And, and you know this can be effective regulation that is going to help actually improve the business climate by removing some of that uncertainty. I think what uh, companies are going to need to be paying attention to here is watching what comes out of the various processes that this executive order sets in motion. There's a number of timelines and it's broken down by a variety of different governmental departments covering different conceptual topics. And I think everybody's going to need to be paying attention to the different proposed rules that are going to be coming out over the next 90, 120, 270 days, et cetera. I think one of the really important things here is going to be what we see coming out of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Anybody who's been involved in, in the protection of any type of computer uh, related patents knows how difficult it can be to figure out what is patent eligible under the ALICE test. And we've seen that pendulum swing back and forth between something being protectable and not protectable for quite a while now. I think it's been, we're getting close to 10 years since that decision came out. And where are the boundaries of what's been protectable and not in the computing space has been sometimes difficult to ascertain. Those boundaries have become even more difficult to ascertain when it comes to artificial intelligence related patents. And there are a lot of them out there. The USPTO has a tracker for the number of, of patent applications that contain AI-related subject material. So I think tasking the USPTO with giving us some guidelines, again, this is not going to be the be-all, end-all, but at least giving us some sort of guidance and some kind of boundary. And obviously, the details will be sorted out through the usual processes of litigation and challenging and whatnot. But that level of certainty is going to help companies understand what are they investing in and what are the maybe given more clarity and what are the odds that their patent is going to be enforceable. Um, speaking to the other areas that you mentioned, again, I think it's going to help create more certainty beyond just saying, hey, you know, companies go out and create your own internal AI use policies, but giving some external guidance for things that are going to be clearly inbounds and things that are going to clear be clearly out of bounds with, for example, HR, potential, you know, discriminatory practices, et cetera. Thanks, Dan. So, and Paul, like in the promulgating of this regulation structure in the way that Marissa was talking about with the implications, Dan was just breaking down, the administration relies heavily on the Defense Production Act as a legal basis for them to take a series of actions. It's not typically how we see the Defense Production Act being implemented. We think about Defense Production Act as, you know, helping secure masks during COVID or um, securing su uh, supply chains of critical industries. Can you break down how the administration is fo was, was focused on the Defense Production Act and, and how they used it as a as a means to, to promulgate this executive order? Sure, thanks. Uh, so, as, as you say, the, the Defense Production Act uh, is, is often used in other contexts. It's a Cold War era law uh, that gives the president power to require increased production of certain key items. Uh, and it was used extensively in COVID and, and I, I checked since then, it's been used for fire hoses uh, in, in wildfire season, uh, parts and labor for Virginia class attack subs, increased production of critical minerals, baby formula, green energy in the context of the Ukraine invasion, the hypersonics industrial base, printed circuit boards and advanced packaging, and now AI. So there's been a decided uptick since COVID in its, in its use, and it's a, it's a new phase in how DPA is, is, is being used. So in the, uh, in the executive order, it requires companies developing dual-use foundation models to provide a lot of information to the Commerce Department, 
including their plans for training, developing, and producing models, uh, their ownership and possession of the model weights, uh, physical and cybersecurity measures that they're taking, red team results when they actually attack their own cybersecurity, and the safety measures that they've taken to respond to those results. So it's it's a very um, a very uh, large amount of very sensitive information that uh, that this executive order is is purporting to require that that companies provide. Uh, section 4.2, where this all is, also requires entities with large-scale computing clusters to report a lot of information as well. So it's 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 something that uh, the critics of the executive order have have focused on immediately uh, as an area where there may be some some challenge to uh, the validity of the order, either either a legal challenge uh, or a congressional pushback. Uh, or certainly, if a, if a new president comes along, they may uh, they may tweak that a little bit. Okay, great. Well, it's it is definitely an interesting use of it, and it's good for us to to keep in mind the potential challenges that may come down in the future. So, uh, Marissa, you mentioned earlier that one of the topics you want to come back to is the definitions, how they defined you know critical terms in this, because that'll guide how the administration's executive actions and the series of steps that they're required to take. What what they what will be their kind of north star about what they're regulating? You want to break down a little bit about the interesting you know, factors of those definitions? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, many of the definitions that we have now seen used in you know colloquial ways, um, such as generative AI, AI systems, um, those are sort of defined in the executive order in a way that I think will be built upon um, through legislation we will see in at the federal level, at states. I think this is going to be um, sort of a model moving forward of how these um, systems are going to be defined and then scoped and then also regulated moving forward. So obviously an agency might come into those definitions and expand or mold them in a, in a slightly different way um, so that they can identify the um, scope of systems regulated for a particular purpose. Um, but those are certainly going to be at least the baseline definitions in my view um, that could, you know, have legal, reputational, et cetera, risks uh, moving forward. And I think that's a good sort of segue, if you don't mind, into um, some of the standards and other rulemakings that we'll see uh, coming out of this executive order. And I think probably the broadest one um, will be this, this sort of uh, standard setting activity coming out of NIST, which we are somewhat familiar with already, given that they have led the charge on the cybersecurity framework, the AI risk framework, et cetera, but they are going to be tasked with um, developing some companion components to those. And then also, you know, if they need to go broader, they will. And that is applicable to AI systems, which is probably the most basic definition used um, in terms of, you know, comparatively to, to generative AI or dual use foundation models, as uh, Paul mentioned here. So uh, those will be, applicable broadly. And again, those types of um, guidance that we have seen coming out of NIST in the past have been really helpful, I think, for companies so that they can understand or at least mitigate some of the, the, res the risks in terms of compliance with those. Yeah, that makes sense. Just sticking with you, Marissa, for just one more second. Another thing that the executive order did is it called on uh, Congress to enact comprehensive uh, consumer data privacy legislation. Obviously, there's an increasing trend at the state level to pass consumer data privacy legislation, making a challenging environment for companies that operate across state lines or on a global basis. We saw, you know, Kathy McMorris Rogers, the chairwoman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, respond quickly and say, I agree with the president, words that she doesn't often use that we need to pass comprehensive consumer privacy legislation. Obviously, there's challenges in Congress, but what are your thoughts on, on what this executive order might mean for that related issue, but, but somewhat distinct issue? Yeah, so, so the EO is actually really interesting on privacy, I think, because it recognizes both how AI can exacerbate the risks on privacy, but then also turns that around and says, okay, we could also use AI to address some of the risks. So using privacy, privacy enhancing technologies to try and address some of the, um, the risks exacerbated by AI, which really uses data as a foundation. Um, many of the models are built on 
you know, huge swaths of data. Um, and then also AI has the capabilities to draw more inferences at a faster you know, pace than we otherwise would have now, depending on the sophistication of, of the model. So um, I think that those are sort of the, the risks that the EO recognizes and, and like I said, encourages the use of privacy enhancing or privacy preserving technologies, but then also says, you know, can we use AI to address some of those risks and tasks the agencies with trying to address that question. Thanks, Marissa. So, uh, Dan, I'm going to send it back over to you. As as this, all of the steps that Marissa is starting to break down there are taking place with NIST standards and and the different regulatory agencies promulgating their their rules. Commerce is not going to stop, right? We're going to continue doing have companies doing business with each other. We're, we as consumers are going to continue to interact with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, what is it that companies should do to start to um, address the risk uh, with the unknown future of what that regulatory environment will look like uh, starting today as as Congress and the or as, sorry as the administration um, starts to move its way through the implementation? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think the first thing is make sure you have an internal AI use policy. I think you need to start there and understand what your company does and, and make sure you have some written policy uh, to govern what's going on internally. And I think you need to kind of break down what we've seen in this executive order into two categories. One are the things that I'm going to call the, the high-risk activities, and then the, the other category being what might happen. The high risk being if you are offering a platform that is available overseas, you're very clearly going to be regulation that comes down involving that, and you should know your customer, um, particularly if you are in any of the uh, spaces that are specifically called out in the executive order, so financial services, et cetera. If you are creating a platform that is involved with CBRN, M, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear, again, that's all called out, you need to be treading very, very carefully here and make sure you are really stepping up protections around your AI model, you should expect to see uh, uh, regulation coming your way. Similarly, if it is a coding platform, um, we don't know where that breakover of you know what could be a cyber weapon and what's not going to be is going to come down, but you really need to be paying attention to those areas. And if that's the type of business you're in, again, tread carefully there and make sure that you are anticipating that there will be regulation coming down about how your tool is trained, how it is used, et cetera. Beyond that, then we get into this category of, well, we're not, you know, we think some stuff is probably going to come out and we should be paying attention. And, and really there, use common sense, right? Don't turn this into the late 90s with Napster where, oh, we can do whatever we want. Let's download every single song we possibly can, right? Be smart about what you're doing. You know, if you're training, uh, for example, on on uh, data from consumers, make sure you have the contractual right to use the data, and don't just use some broad contractual grant like a business associate agreement. If you're involved with uh, protected health information, for example, make sure you have the actual right to use uh, that data, and don't try to hide behind some of those, you know, just broad screens. Um, you know, uh, proceed with caution and, and reasonable steps to protect and restrict your, uh, your, your model and your tools and whatever it is you're developing and make sure you're documenting what you're doing. You have, you know, so if any questions are raised in response to forthcoming regulations, rather than having to try to back your way into the answers, you have it already. That'll make your life easier going forward. Thanks, Dan. And Paul, I'll direct the next one to you. I mean, the EO talks a lot about making sure that AI tools are reliable and safe or safe and secure. Um, that makes sense. We as a country want to make sure that we have AI tools that are not creating any unnecessary you know, risks to our, our national security or to us as consumers. Uh, but it also can't be true that the administration is, is uh, taking the position that every AI tool is going to get a, you know, blessed by the government, certified by the government before it goes out there. Can you talk a little bit about what the executive order is attempting to accomplish by stating that AI needs to be uh, you know, safe and secure um, and how they would go about doing that? 
Yeah, well, thank you. And I think that that uh, rests within the AI risk framework and 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 a couple of the other uh, approaches that the administration has has taken. Uh, we're not we're not concerned about special purpose AI that is that is very focused on on a particular task. We're much more concerned about general AI uh, and 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 AI that has a, a, a wider variety of capabilities or AI that, as Dan was just discussing, is is being used in uh, particular high risk areas. And so I think the 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 executive order tries to take a uh, a nuanced approach by more. Uh, by, by by paying more attention to and requiring more of companies that are are developing these more capable AIs and 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 more generally applicable AIs. Gotcha. That makes sense. <laughs> um, and so as as we ensure that AI is safe and secure, and the government attempts to do that, um, one of the uh, Marissa, I'll direct this one to you. One of the things that the executive order does is kind of is direct the administration. The administration, the government, also is not just a regulator in this circumstance, but they're also a customer, which makes sense. The government is one of the you know, largest kind of businesses in the United States that has needs of its own to try and leverage the efficiencies of AI. But the risks are oftentimes even more acute because they hold consumer data. Um, and you know could impact you know us as, as citizens' lives. But could you walk through a little bit about what the executive order does to ensure that the AI that the government purchases or or uses um, is is secure and how that might impact your know, government contractors? Sure. So um, the OMB director, the Office of Management and Budget, has is directed under the EO to. Um, provide guidance to agencies on uh, the risk management measures that they should be taking in terms of the AI systems um, and technologies that they're using. Um, I think we will see sort of a, an outpour from there of, um, you know, potentially later on down through the, you know, chain to actual um, companies, perhaps requirements, um, there is a there is a suggestion that there may need to be um, a an amendment to the FAR to reflect some of the um, standards that are referenced in the EO. So um, there's also mention of GSA, the General Services Administration. Um, you know, taking a look at FedRAMP and making sure that um, all of these principles that we're talking about are consistent um, within the standards there as well. Um, the other thing as well is it's not just in the AI systems that the government is focused. There's also mention of commercial, commercially available um, information. And this was sort of a, a, um, a connection to privacy. Uh, basically, the government uses various contracts and vendors to obtain information. Um, and there is a provision of the executive order that requires uh, the government to take a look at the information that they are collecting um, and making sure that that information is uh, secure and sort of minimized under data minimization principles, which are not mentioned, but I'm sort of inserting here. Um, I think there's a lot here about it, that we can sort of discern about how the government is going to uh, move forward on the principles of making sure that uh, both on the critical infrastructure side, on the contracting side, um, and then also on the opportunity side, I mean, there's certainly an element um, of the EO that's really focused on how the government can use AI to its benefit um, and become more efficient. Thanks, Marissa. And so, uh, Todd, maybe I'll come back to you real quick. We've talked about how Congress was involved in the front end in helping address the uh, issue and highlighted having a number of forums. We talked a little bit about privacy legislation, which was addressed in the executive order. Um, but how do you think, you know, based on the reaction so far, we're still in early days, you know, less than 24 hours after the signing of the executive order, but how do you think that Congress might get involved in um, the AI you know, issue, you know, besides legislation? Do you think that there might be other steps that they would take um, to try and advance either to support the president's uh, agenda here as it relates to AI? Um, through hearings and, and the bully pulpit or you know, other actions that they might take? Well, I think that you will continue to see hearings and activity on this um, 
throughout the rest of, of the Congress. And I think that if the House of Representatives is kind of stabilized, then I think that, you know, you're you're very likely to start see and start seeing considerably more activity over there. There have been things going on, but they haven't maybe necessarily been quite as public. When you do look though at things that can happen and things which could could which which could support this executive order, I do think that there's broad agreement around funding, around that that you do need to put some money into various programs, some of which might already exist. Um, and you need to kind of have that funding dedicated towards just putting more resources within the US government towards AI. Part of that is just the reality, which is that you know the the major players the major players in this space are some of the biggest companies in the entire world. And so their ability to hire people, um, th their ability just to have basic resources, um, to do research, to do all those things at the moment um, probably outguns government. Um, it outguns definitely major academic institutions. Um, and I think that there's a realization within Congress that you need to do something to try um, to maybe narrow that gap. I don't know if you can ever surpass it. Um, and so what I well, what I would say is maybe the most likely scenario, and I'm still a little bit pessimistic that Congress will get anything to the president's desk on, on AI, would be some type of package, which again would include funding, um, maybe in existing programs, but kind of dedicated towards new spaces um, in research or the or in in research or in, or in other things that are concerning AI. Thanks, Dad. And one one quick political question too. You know, what what do you think? There's always the the unknown um, that might happen in the political arena. But what what might happen if a presidential candidate there's a you know a, a spoof or they they um, artificial intelligence is used to disrupt the election? You know, how might that change the dynamic or supercharge a potential overreaction from Congress? I think, yeah, actually, that's that's a really great question. Um, you know, the thing that Congress does best is that it overreacts to, to various things which 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 happen. We've seen this for forever. Um, just kind of comes an axiom of it. Um, I, I, I think there are two things there. I think actually to come back to your previous question, one other possible area would be basic democracy elections, something on that. It might be as simple as um, if you're going to run an ad using AI, you have to acknowledge that. You have to watermark it. You have to do whatever else. It could be something um, as simple as that. And, you know, certainly that could flow out of the type of scenario that you're talking about, Joel. Um, you know, in, in working with um, some of our clients, uh, one thing that they repeat very frequently is if you look at the time frame um, for when certain advancements in AI were supposed to happen, um, they've almost always been wrong and they've almost always been too late. Um, and I think Paul and I heard from one of our pretty smart clients uh, yesterday, he said that they had been late by a, a factor of 4X. Um, so when you look at that in the context of Joel's question, it could be an election issue, it might be something else. It, may, it might be something even bigger. But if you look at how quickly, just to take one example, chat GPT ha has advanced and you think about what the next one will actually look like and when that will be here. Um, yeah, I think there is absolutely a possibility of some type of major event happening with AI next year and Congress scrambling um, to try and figure out how they can deal with it. Now, I'm not saying that's what Senator Schumer is kind of planning on, but I would say that, you know, coming together, doing these forums, building an idea of what you would do in, 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 in an ideal world prepares you if something like that happens. Um, it would be less than ideal. It's always better to, to try and legislate when you're not in crisis. Um, but sometimes that's what it takes. Yeah, 100 percent. But it's a good reminder, too, to be making sure to educate both the legislators and, and the regulators as to what you intend to deploy, how you intend to deploy and what the capabilities are to avoid that overreaction. If, if the inevitable happens, that there is some uh, error or issue that, that gets rolled out in an AI product, either that you have developed as a company or that you've contracted um, uh, as a consumer, uh, uh, a business to business consumer of AI. So we're getting a number of questions coming in through the chat. I'd encourage you if you have a question to submit it to the through the Q and A. Um, thank you for those who have already submitted questions. So one of the questions that came in was the Biden administration also has been taking a number of actions related to you know restrictions of the export of 
things like semiconductor chips and critical technology that would be the enable, enablers of artificial intelligence to places like China. Um, so the question was, you know, how might this uh, artificial intelligence executive order further accelerate those actions or how do they, you know, what are some uh, tangential impacts that, that it might have? But Marissa, do you mind taking a cut at that one? Sure. So um, at a high level, I think we've, we've certainly hit upon this, but the EO is extremely broad. And one of the things that it does is focus on focuses on competition um, and this, and I am getting to semiconductors, but um, what it does in the competition section is it essentially says that uh, startups and small businesses <laughs> should be sort of emphasized um, and be a large part of the focus for um, the CHIPS incentives program for the research and development um, notice of funding opportunity that has yet to come out. It's the last one, um, which is sort of an interesting, uh, you know, dynamic to, to place in there. Um, and the other piece is that the NSTC, which is another CHIPS Act um, program, that is being run through NIST at the Department of Commerce, uh, they also are, you know, directed to try and work in any sort of requirements or um, suggested uh, technical assessments or resources to small businesses and startups so that they can be part of the program and, and basically have a, a membership structure that supports those folks. So. Um, it, it, it certainly is an emphasis in the EO uh, because semiconductors are what you know AI is built on. So, um, it, but it, it's interesting because there isn't actually a mention of AI technologies in in those um, you know sections of the EO. So that was sort of slipped in there. Thanks, Marissa. Another question that we had coming through the chat was an issue related to uh, foreign competition and foreign uh, cooperation with other countries as we're thinking in this in, you know, increasingly global world that we operate in, um, entering into agreements or incorporating technology or foreign companies looking to deploy AI in the United States. Um, Paul, maybe you could take this, like how, how do you think this executive order would impact you know, potential foreign cooperation on artificial intelligence, joint rulemakings or moving in the same direction? And then just the practical B2B type uh, consideration. Sure, thank you. Well, I think it, it definitely takes place in the context of our international relationships. And indeed, we're seeing Prime Minister Sunak and, and uh, the uh, United Kingdom taking steps uh, almost simultaneously on this front. And, and we anticipate uh, later this week that there will be a, a, a bilateral arrangement between the United States and, uh, and the United Kingdom on AI. I think we're going to see much more of that, particularly among the Five Eyes and within NATO more broadly. Uh, and and it's going to be important both from a supply chain perspective and from a, a broader export control perspective for for our uh, ability as 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 allies to compete effectively um, and to, uh, uh, to 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 stay uh, up to speed with China among others. Thanks, Paul. Um, another question we had come in. This one's Dan is is directed to you. Um, the question is related to how do you make sure that you're uh, protecting the consumers that you as a business might interact with um, to make sure that there is not a you know, synthetic uh, AI that is coming uh, on the other side. If you think you referenced earlier that kind of know your customer uh, type considerations, but can you talk a little bit about you know, how do you authenticate um, who you're doing business with and um, how do you make sure that you are verifying things in this new world uh, to manage your risk related to uh, artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think you know, the executive order has laid out a few items that we need to be conscious of. And they, you know, we're talking about things like recording address, telephone number, email, IP addresses, and dates of access to the tool. Those are all things that we know are coming down the pipe for certain AI tools. And I think that those should probably be adopted as best practices for most uh, for most AI tools that are being released out into the public is making sure that you know, you're tracking who is actually <laughs> using the tool because I think businesses need to expect that the government at some point in the near future, particularly with the high risk ones, uh, AI tools is going to come asking for that information. So names, addresses, how what you did to verify that information to the extent you're a high-risk tool, email, telephone, 
an IP address and dates of access, those would be the, the seven things that I think we're going to be seeing as a as as becoming the standard for anything beyond just your basic, um, you know, your, your your basic chat bots that are used by you know people like me. Um, I, I think the other thing that that companies need to be doing is working with your counterparties to understand whether or not your counterparty, but for example, if you hire a marketing agency, whether or not that marketing agency is going to be allowed to use AI tools or not. I think you need to start including that in your contracts stating you know whether or not such use will be permitted and if it is permitted how and under what circumstances one of the problems with these ai tools is they're you know they're amazing at what they can do but they also enable people like me who has absolutely no artistic ability whatsoever to create very convincing fakes and you know that's something that you used to be the 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 domain of people with really really you know extraordinary artistic or other types of skills, but now, you know, to the general public can access tools that can make a really good fake, and and we need to be watching out for that. Businesses need to make sure that they have in their contracts what is allowed, what is not allowed, what are the penalties for breaching that, and making sure any content that you're putting out there, um, you've reviewed and you've gotten uh, a confirmation that in fact. Um, it is not AI generated, or to the extent that it is, you watermark it and you you put out there just like you have to do with uh, you know like hashtag ad, right? Or with sponsored content that you are informing the public that yeah this is this is an AI generated image, for example, and that the product isn't really going to you know make you the you know the the best driver or the the best uh, golfer or whatever in the world. Yeah, those are super important considerations that are going to be uh, tricky to solve. Thanks, Dan, for breaking that down. Another question we got in was uh, in through the chat was that um, the executive order, uh, and Paul, I'll direct this one to you, does a lot to direct a executive branch agencies to take particular actions. We also do have independent agencies, um, certainly agencies that come to mind, like the uh, Federal Trade Commission. Um, which uh, I will put in a shameless plug that next week our, our partner Tony DiResta is having a chat with um, Fed, Federal Trade Commission on artificial intelligence and what they're doing um, in that space that we would uh, certainly encourage you all to participate and should be an interesting uh, kind of fireside chat. But for those independent agencies, um, Paul, what you know? What are the implications of this executive order, of order for them? Sure, thank you. And and uh, the executive order did address not only virtually every cabinet agency, but a number of these independent agencies as well. And in the context of that, and it's uh, you, you've got the FTC, as you mentioned, the FCC, the FEC are all are all playing in uh, in areas that are impacted by, by AI. And in the case of independent agencies, the executive order treads very carefully and says, you know, to the extent that that you deem it appropriate, do this, this, and this, uh, and, and, but, but is, is very clearly giving guidance uh, on, on how that independent agency could proceed in ways that were consistent with the rest of government. And it will be interesting to see uh, as, as each of these agencies moves forward, the degree to which they, they stay in that lane that's been marked out for them uh, or, or go beyond it or just in a different direction entirely. Yeah, and that relates to another question we got, which is, which is focused on uh, the telecommunications industry, which the questioner noted was you know, is heavily focused on, on technology, but also artificial intelligence. And I think that consideration with the FCC and how they might, you know, as, as an independent agency, uh, regulate it, even though a lot of the focus of the, the news media and the headlines is on consumer facing or business to business um, uh, artificial intelligence, I do think that telecommunications as a highly regulated industry in the United States is going to, the FCC is definitely going to go down this pathway a little harder to control or predict potentially than the executive branch, which could be more in lockstep with the administration. Uh, but I, I certainly uh, think that the FCC is not going to take a backseat um, to regulating the existence of, of AI um, in those uh, circumstances. Uh, so we have time just for a few more questions. If anybody has any last questions they want to submit, uh, feel free, but we'll we'll go through uh, these last couple. There is some uh, language in the executive order related to uh, AI research um, that's going to be conducted as a result of the executive order to evaluate uh, as a federal government um, uh, the uh, extent of artificial intelligence, but I know Marissa or or uh, Paul, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the, the, the research components? 
<laughs> well, I, there are going to be uh, a number of research uh, activities underway, including through the Department of Energy, uh, NSF, and and uh, and other science-focused organizations. HHS, HHS uh, <laughs> Veterans Affairs, yeah. actually is getting involved in in, in ways to uh, to develop AI for uh, for improved veteran service. So uh, the executive order tackles a lot of that, uh, and and we'll just. I think that'll be both an, an opportunity for companies to partner, uh, an opportunity to stress test some of the controls um, in the in the federal context, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. Yeah, I think there's a few mentions of grant funding and um, other opportunities that I think are important to highlight. I mean, it goes back to you know the government really making a statement here saying that they want to invest in AI, understanding that that's how they stay competitive. Um, and improve their operations. The one thing I think we haven't mentioned yet that I want to is uh, the healthcare um, provisions in the EO, which are there's a strong focus on healthcare uh, and drug development in terms of both the you know, the risks associated um, with those and then also the benefits. And so that's another that's another place that I would you know, draw your attention to as uh, you know both an opportunity but also a place that is potentially going to be highly regulated when it comes to AI. Yep, and I think that that leads to a question that was asked about, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, how they might um, address uh, AI happening in the healthcare space. This has been a, an issue that um, our healthcare team uh, within the public policy and regulation group is uh, leaning in on, and I'm sure we'll be doing some separate programming and, and client alerts related to the AI executive order. And its impact on healthcare, but the question about the practice of medicine and currently that is regulated and uh, by professional certifications in in states, but how AI both in the performance of procedures and the um, diagnosing of uh, of conditions um, that is starting to get a lot trickier to identify. Was it the human physician that was um, identifying the the issue or performing the surgery, or was it the artificial intelligence? Or machine learning that was helping and assisting, and so those are going to be challenges that we're we as a country are going to have to continue uh, to address. And of course, you know the reimbursement um, uh, mechanisms that Congress or that the executive branch has through Medicare, Medicaid, and private health insurance programs will have to adjust um, to uh, address that um, those transitions as well. So, we'll, for the last question here um, that we have is. A question, Dan, I'll, I'll put it back to you because um, it relates to something you've brought up a couple of times is how do you disclose the use of artificial intelligence? The question coming in says, you know, what would be the trigger to require the disclosure of AI use? You know, for example, what level of human, human intervention in the model output would be required in order not to need the generated by AI disclosure? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, mean, I guess that's the, you know, the $64,000 question these days, right? Is at what point? Do we go from having you know something created by a human to something created by a machine? Put another way, right? How much inter how much human um, interaction with like an Adobe uh, Photoshop, right, is is necessary to you know if I apply filters to my pictures, right? I selected the filter, but the computer did the rest of the work. Is it you know? But I still made the choice, right? And and the artistic choice, so. It, we don't really know at what point, and this is something that is being fought on multiple battlefronts uh, across the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, across the U.S. Copyright Office, and, 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 and in courts right now as to where is that tr that cutover point between something that was created by a human, something that was created by a machine, or something that was co-created. Um, I, I, I think at this point, any use of AI should probably be disclosed, at least internally amongst business partners, because if certain ongoing litigation comes out a, cert, uh, a, a particular way, those tools may be found to be infringing copyrights of third parties, and then that would open a Pandora's box of potential liability and litigation. Um, so at least just internally understanding any use of AI, you need to know that to understand where that risk might be lying. On the on the the publicly facing side, and for example, in your advertisements or your social media posts, et cetera. Um, again, I think you know, erring on the side of caution. Any you know, if you're using AI to create images or create text that is not being heavily edited by a human, 
I think you need to be cautious and make sure that you are are disclosing that fact. Thanks, Dan. So we'll wrap up with a lightning round here in the last three minutes. But before we do so, just wanted to let you know we are putting out a client alert that will summarize a lot of the topics that we've talked about here. This, of course, there's no way to, to write in an analysis that covers every aspect of this. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of the presenters. Um, as Dave mentioned at the beginning, we are part of a larger tech industry sector group that includes over 200 attorneys. So uh, we can get you to the right person that could answer the specific question that you might have. But lightning round, I'd love to hear from each of you kind of what's the one big thing that you're interested in that's going that you want to know how the administration um, takes that next step at following the executive order on artificial intelligence. For me, the one big thing would be how Congress reacts. Um, I'm interested to see. Does Congress feel like this is this is comfortable? Do they feel like we need to legislate um, to require you know particular uh, purchasing or or co government contracting uh, provisions? That's mine. But uh, Paul, we'll start with you. What's your one big thing? Thanks. I'm interested in the national security implications and and uh, what's going to flow from that in terms of export controls and and, uh, and so forth. Marissa, um, I'm probably interested in uh, privacy. First and foremost, just because I, I practice in that area so much, to, to trying to get a sense of how that uh, shakes out at the end of the day. Great. Dan, how about you? What's your one big thing? You know, I'm, I'm interested to see what's going to happen with data. These models are driven heavily by data. Uh, US has 330 million uh, uh, citizens, China has 1.4 billion. Just in terms of raw numbers, you know, we are behind and, and how this is going to shake out with data and where data goes. and whether there will be restrictions on data, I think is gonna be very, very important to the US keeping our leadership in technology. Fantastic. Well, we hope you, you found this to be a productive conversation. We will continue to dig into this executive order and the follow on actions and look forward to doing that together uh, with you as we as a country try and uh, get ahead of and tackle the, the new uh, opportunities and challenges uh, created by artificial intelligence. Thank you for joining today.